Hi, and welcome to Rabo TV, where we shine the spotlight on rural opportunities and challenges. This week on the show, I'll be updating you on the latest market movements, and Dennis will talk about the rocketing canola prices. First, we're joined by Mary O'Brien, a passionate advocate for mental health services, particularly for country blokes, and founder of Are You Bogged Mate? Thanks for joining us today, Mary. So what is the concept behind Are You Bogged Mate? Well, I guess it's really just using the analogy of um, a machine and are we looking after it? Are we servicing it? Are we driving it too hard? Um, when do we need to slow down? When do we need to service it? When do we need to take a break? When we think about ourselves like that, um, it puts a different perspective on it and particularly resonates with country blokes. Are there measures men can take to stay out of the mud, so to speak? Everyone's so busy these days and particularly men like to put other people before themselves. So they really need to take that time to do the things that they enjoy doing, that they really find relaxing or fun to do and um, make it a priority to actually look after yourself first because once you look after yourself, then you're much better placed to look after other people. And Mary, what do you suggest is the first step for men needing a bit of help? You know, the first things you can do is talk to your mates or your family, your loved ones, because they've probably noticed that that something's not quite right for you. So uh, reach out to somebody. And um, I guess um, when people do get bogged, they, they tend not to reach out. So I, I really tend to ask the people around them to reach in. So for loved ones, what are some of the triggers to look out for? The signs and symptoms we're looking for are particularly changes in behaviour. And that's why, you know, the friends, the family, the work colleagues of people are the front line. They are the people who are seeing these things um, or the changes in their in their friends and family. So I, um, you know, changes in um, diet, changes in weight, changes in sleep patterns, um, changes in moods, any of those sort of extreme things. Um, we also see things that may not trigger someone to think, oh, there's something going on here. So things like cleaning out the shed and giving away possessions, um, quitting activities that were previously important to them. So Anything that's different or out of, out of the norm for that person are some of the signs and symptoms that we can look for. And what if a partner still won't open up about their issues? When I do talks for women, I get this question a lot. And the women say, he, he won't talk to me. And my answer to that is, and he may never talk to you about it. So men tend to be protectors and providers. And so they don't want to burden their wife or partner with, their issues and, and and bog them down as well, I guess. So the men tend to want to think it out to work it out. And when they can't, um, and we certainly see this where they don't know what to do and they're sort of stuck, their partner knows there's a problem, but they can't convince them to go and talk to a professional. So what I encourage those partners to do is make the time for that man to go and have time with people he may talk to. Um, and I guess when it's someone that we care about and that we love, we often want them to open up to us and to talk to us. And that may not be the case. We may not be the best person for that person to open up to. So make sure they get to have time around people that they are more likely to open up to. So that might be his best mate or something. You know, make sure they go camping or fishing or playing golf or whatever it is that they do to relax and have time together. Um, Camping's a great one because there's often a fire and blokes sit around it in the dark and they feel much more comfortable opening up in those sort of situations. And how does it feel when a man opens up and talks to you? But even if I'm just talking to someone on the phone and they offload something that they've carried for a long time and I talk about their buckets, their emotional buckets, something that's been weighing in their bucket for many years, um, you can actually hear a change in their voice and when you are physically with them, you can actually see their shoulders lift and it is literally like a weight's been lifted off that they've actually been able to get that out, unburden themselves with that and it's it's just like great. We can just, you know, it's part of the process of unpacking that and, and letting it go and leaving it behind. Thanks so much, Mary. It's great to see your commitment to supporting rural health and helping families across Australia. No, thank you very much for having me. It's been great. It's a huge issue, isn't it? It is, Ben, and it's great to see someone so passionate and making a difference. What's happening in the markets this week? Equity markets continue to trade near record highs as earnings season in the United States rolls on. 
This week will be a big one for determining the durability of the rising market as some of the biggest names in Silicon Valley are due to report corporate earnings. Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Amazon and Tesla are amongst those names and analysts will be hoping for some strong numbers after Netflix disappointed the market last week. US equities are trading at their richest valuation since the dot-com bubble of the late 1990s, following big gains for technology companies during the COVID-19 lockdowns last year and moves by central banks around the world to provide some of the cheapest money in history. Some analysts argue that historically low interest rates justify the very high valuations, but solid results this week will still be very important to calm the nerves of traders. A further point of concern for markets this week is the big rise in COVID-19 infection numbers in India. The West Australian Premier has been vocal in calling for a temporary ban on travellers from India as new case numbers have exceeded 300,000 per day. This comes following the announcement of a snap three-day lockdown in Perth last week and revelations that 40% of positive cases in hotel quarantine are from travellers who have recently returned from India. There are also concerns around a new mutant strain of the virus originating from the region, which may be somewhat resistant to existing vaccines. Commodity prices have been rallying nicely in recent times, which is great news for Australia. Iron ore is trading at more than $180 per metric tonne, which should provide a nice boost to the budget, which is due to be handed down in May. Chicago wheat futures also closed strongly last week with a December 22 contract dealing at above 315 Aussie dollars per tonne, and Brent crude is fetching just over 66 US dollars per barrel. Later today, we will see Australian inflation data for the first quarter of this year released. Markets are expecting CPI inflation to come in at about 1.4% year on year, but a number of banks are expecting a surprise to the upside. This will be quite an important number for setting expectations of the future direction of interest rates, as the RBA has previously stated that they will not be raising the cash rate until inflation is sustainably within their 2 to 3% target band. And that's finance. It's a critical week in the markets. Absolutely, and it could really set the tone for the rest of the year. And now over to Dennis for Chart of the Week. Thanks, Claudine. Since the beginning of 2020, prices for canola or rapeseed have skyrocketed globally. The price of Matif rapeseed, which is the price of non-GM canola in Europe, our biggest export market, has appreciated by more than 40% since January 2020. The price of ice canola, which is the price of GM canola in Canada, our biggest export competitor, has appreciated by an astronomical 87% since January 2020. What has been the cause of such a significant price rise? Well, there have been, of course, canola-specific factors, but equally important has been the tightness in the global oilseed complex more broadly. This chart shows global stocks, excluding China, of key oilseeds. Stocks of soybeans, canola, and sunflower oil are together at seven-year lows. The broader oilseed shortage has been driven by two main factors. Firstly, African swine fever easing in China and causing a strong rebound in imports of soybeans for pig rations, expected at over 100 million tonnes this marketing year. And secondly, production shortfalls in key producing markets, from North and South American soybeans to sunflower seed in the Black Sea, production is performing below expectations. On canola specifically, production in two of the world's biggest canola producing regions, Europe and Canada, are below average for a second consecutive year, and combined are seeing the lowest production in seven years. The only supply side saviour around the world is Australia, where the most recent winter crop harvest saw production approach an all-time record high. Total worldwide import demand of canola this marketing year is expected to reach record levels, driven largely by record high European imports on the back of poor local production, but also strengthening demand for biodiesel. Furthermore, we also saw improvements in demand from China, the United Arab Emirates, and Japan. What has this meant for local prices? Well, prices for Australian canola have been strong for a number of years, particularly for non-GM canola, which has been in very short supply. This year, as the canola shortage worldwide intensified even further, prices, for example, in Quinana, Western Australia, have moved to further 31% and 15% higher year on year for GM and non-GM canola, respectively. Having said that, Australian prices have lagged behind international levels. Why did they lag? 
The answer primarily lies in the fact that we had a near record harvest in Australia, leaving us with plentiful levels of canola to sell and export. Looking towards the year ahead though, European and Canadian prices are expected to gravitate closer to Australia's as new harvests come online in the Northern Hemisphere from July onwards. What should we expect for Australia? Well, canola market fundamentals are expected to remain strong, but with Northern Hemisphere harvest just around the corner and some downside risks in play, record prices should not be taken for granted. So what does this mean for Australian farmers? Well, it means that in a year, when we're growing a lot more canola instead of barley, prices are going to be great at harvest and we'll have something to sell. Thanks, Dennis. And that wraps up another episode of Rabo TV. Thank you for joining us. Next week, we talk with award-winning startup ProAgni, developer of Australia's first antibiotic free stock nutrition range. We'll see you then. <laughs>